Tym bardzo miło mi powitać pana Saszę, czyli Aleksandra Kowalenko z firmy Allegro, która opowie nam dzisiaj o systemach rekomendacyjnych. Ja w sumie mówię, bo, znaczy tak, pan Sasza będzie mówił po angielsku. Pytania, jak żeśmy uzgodnili, można zadawać też po polsku, więc czujmy się swobodnie. Panu Saszy lepiej, lepiej używać do takich zawodowych rzeczy języka angielskiego, więc dlatego myślę, że to nie będzie dla nikogo jakiś problem. Panie Saszo, zapraszamy i dziękujemy za to, że przyjął Pan nasze zaproszenie. Dziękuję. So, thank you very much. Uh, let's start today's presentation. Uh, so, first, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, I'm a research, a senior research engineer in uh, at Allegro. Uh, so, Allegro is a huge Polish e-commerce platform, uh, number one on the market, Polish market. So it's kind of big stuff. Uh, and uh, today, uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the presentation. I'm going to tell you about the recommender systems. Uh, so I turned off my uh, camera because of uh, internet <laughs> issues. So please be patient and tell me if uh, I'm off. So, okay, uh, first uh, introduction, so this presentation is called Introduction to the Recommender Systems, and the problem is uh, that uh, I know that you have some background in Recommender Systems, and I still decided to keep the title, Introduction, uh, in, the, in, this, in this way that... Uh, but not all, but not all, not all have such background, <laughs> it's okay. okay. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, even even if some guys uh, do have this background, uh, I'm st I still want to keep the title because like recommender assist recommenders and recommender systems are really a huge topic, and uh, it's impossible like to give some uh, like comprehensive view and uh, systemized systemized view on the um, field in just one single lecture. And this will be introduction, but from my personal perspective, not like a company or group of people in just my personal opinion on the recommender systems. Uh, it's the opinion of a person who worked in a large company of these recommenders. Okay, so and uh, like, like subtitle, so what happens when the theory meets scale? Yeah, and uh, Allegra, I told you it's a big e-commerce platform and we have this issue so that we have to scale this regular um, recommender systems to a huge, huge scale. So let's start. Uh, oops, uh, so the outline. Uh, so my introduction will be a bit wag in the sense that it's, I don't want to go into super details how those like algorithm works uh, and so on. Uh, I just wanted to do, do, give you some uh, large like bird view or airplane view a sketch of what we are doing. Yeah, the, <laughs> this way I'm killing like two uh, rabbits or <laughs> yeah, you know, other animal. Uh, so I don't have to get an approval from <laughs> our corporate guys. And uh, it will be more like fun for you because it's kind of uh, the, the work, the job is boring. <laughs> but if you look at a broader, if you have a broader view, it's somehow interesting. So it's really interesting. And I do love recommender systems and so on. So uh, let's go. So first, I'll give you the introduction. Uh, I'll tell you about the commander systems, about Allegro itself. Why do we need commander systems? Then we'll go. We'll talk about evaluation measures and uh, like different types of evaluation measures and why do we need. Uh, so we will understand why I put the slide first. The slide first. Then we will move to collaborative filtering algorithms. We'll talk about some classical examples and some uh, extensions to those uh, examples. Uh, next, uh, we will be talking about how to add some features in the sense like uh, feature representations of uh, the documents that we uh, want to recommend to the user and uh, users themselves. Uh, okay. Uh, then we'll talk about personalization and uh, I'll try to <laughs> explain what do I mean about this magic word personalization. Um, then we will dive to some future experiments. So what we are planning to do, what actually I am planning to do and why I want, uh, what are my ambitions and I want to try. And the last is just like production notes like some um, probably useful or not, <laughs> it depends on you, uh, stuff that we just uh, do 
and how it looks like in productions. Also, like super general, but you can ask questions. You are encouraged to ask uh, questions actually, because uh, I, did, I, I decided to make it like a colloquium. So uh, this presentation is just a, a preamble to introduction to the conversation itself. So like, yeah, I will, not, I will not tell you everything. So this is intentional. Uh, let's go, go next. Uh, so, uh, what is the recommender system? Probably you know, but let's remind ourselves. So, recommender system can be defined a kind of it's a kind of a special type of uh, information retrieval systems that tries to model preference for the documents. And I don't like this definition. Oops. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Okay. Go on. Yes. 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 So and. Uh, Okay, okay. Uh, so, and I don't like this definition, frankly speaking, uh, because uh, it actually does not explain you <laughs> what is the recommendation the system itself, but uh, it's the problem for generalization. So, uh, this definition trying to generalize uh, different uh, entities that are used in different aspects of our lives and different um, branches and fields. So maybe uh, let's look at this recommender system from another perspective. Uh, how do we use them and where are they used? And uh, for example, recommender systems uh, are used in online streaming services, for example, like uh, Netflix, yeah, the most famous, and <laughs> I suppose you heard multiple times of them. Uh, yeah, so we want to recommend movies. So we model the preference of our new movies. You want to model the taste of the user and so on. Uh, E-commerce, e-commerce, it's kind the obvious application you want to model the preference over the items uh, uh. Yes, so that we want to sell to the end user news aggregators because some people like sports, some like music, uh, and so on. And you also want to like personalize the feed, uh, the news feed, like dating platforms. Yeah, it's, it, it turns out that. So they also uh, use recommender systems uh, for their needs, and uh, yeah, <laughs> they even write some articles, uh, scientific articles. And uh, if you look at those like, fields, those fields are pretty different. The differs and the goals of these recommender systems uh, are different. So. That's why like recommenders are like difficult because they solve different problems. So most of the definition we know they are uh, utilitary definition. So the spoon is something to eat, something liquid. Yeah. <laughs> so this is utilitary definition. But you can make utilitary definition for a uh, uh, recommender system because <laughs> recommender systems usually solve different stuff. So that's my point. Uh, yeah, so uh, like they are ubiquitous and uh, practically any system that has like a user data interaction. So you, you want your users to interact with your aggregated data on your platform, you will need some sort of recommender system or, or information material system. And that's why we are here and we are talking about the recommender systems now. Okay, so uh, recommendations at Allegro. Why do we need them at Allegro? Uh, so I already answered this question when I was talking about e-commerce because Allegro is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, e-commerce platform and uh, we want our users to have a better experience. We want our users to buy the goods they need. So Allegro provides uh, an online service that <laughs> provides some goods, uh, some uh, uh, items to the end users. Uh, yeah, and uh, that's that's what we do in in Allegro. But <laughs> Allegro is the huge uh, dynamic web page, and it's difficult to say where where the uh, recommendations is used. So I, I could actually make uh, screenshots of them, but when you enter, <laughs> it will be different. It might look different for you, and uh, those will not be <laughs> the recommendation uh, feeds. So the the static. Uh, feed from uh, uh, pure recommendations uh, are uh, at, the, at the view of the item. So when you go to Allegro, you open some item, for example, like screwdriver, uh, and you will see like top, you will see multiple of car results. The, the, the top one uh, is the top placement uh, actually shows uh, like another items of this seller. And uh, 
those are the recommendations. But those recommendations are restricted to one particular uh, seller. Okay, and uh, at the bottom of this page, uh, we have another another carousel, uh, which is called another clients were viewing this. Uh, and uh, this is also uh, a recommendation carousel. And uh, this is more like free carousel because there is no this restriction imposed on, uh, on these items. We don't need them to come from the same seller. So this one uh, on the right hand side, it's like uh, vanilla <laughs> recommendations. Okay, so the bottom line that we have various places on the platform, but the most obvious to show <laughs> and to like broader audience is this placement. Yeah, it's one of the most common places you will you will uh, you will see the recommendation uh, from Allegro. Okay, so if this is clear, let's move to the next slide. So what are the issues that are specific to Allegro? Um, so when I was telling that there are different domains and uh, they solve different problems, uh, they have also some specific issues that uh, are related only to their domains. And that actually those issues are data uh, like induced and Allegro is also have their own issues. So if you like will work in Allegro and then you will move to, I don't know, for, uh, to Spotify to work on uh, some different type of recommender system, you will face obviously different issues. So now I'm going to tell you about what uh, is specific for uh, Allegro. Uh, first, uh, what uh, you have to deal with is just like immense scale of items on the platform. We have uh, like, 0.2 billion, 200 million uh, items on the platform, and we have to deal with, with this. Also, we have a large number of uh, users on the platform. It's like 20 or 30 million. I don't know the exact numbers, but the scale is uh, totally right. Uh, third issue is the high load. It means that uh, there are many people on the platform online. Like at this moment, it's one of these uh, shopping peaks on the platform, and it means that every second we have like tons of requests bombarding our uh, servers, and, and uh, we have to deal with this high load. So we just can't. Uh, create the super sophisticated model and you can make your users wait for eternity <laughs> for you to calculate the recommendation okay uh, so the fourth issue is the uh, lifetime of the items of the service so we still have some like bids so you have some auctions and uh, those items have a relatively short uh, lifetime. It means like something can live for uh, just a few days or a few uh, weeks. So, so there is some there is an item on the service. Uh, in two weeks, it's no longer active. So we can't use it for a recommendation or to predict another future like directly without any uh, hints and, uh, and from other perspective if you have a model you train it today this model will not be as good <laughs> as it was today tomorrow yeah it will change so it's uh, dynamic setting and this is uh, complicates the story uh, dramatically and uh, the data quality and the data quality actually matters and uh, this is also a big issue so if you look at some text descriptions, so uh, we we are like uh, we are a platform. We are not a web page. We are not totally one hundred percent responsible for the content. Actually, the, the sellers themselves create the uh, like the content of uh, the page for a particular item on the platform, and that's the issue because you can control. We, we actually have some policies to encourage them to uh, create good descriptions, nice images. Actually, we don't accept a bad images anymore uh, at Allegro, so it's clean, but still there is a room to uh, write some nonsense in the description of your item when you're selling. And that's the big issue for us, because when you try to model uh, like those descriptions as some uh, represent 
this uh, descriptions uh, so some like vectors in uh, in some embedding space and this will be a mess uh, most likely because of uh, this issue and also the data quality in the sense of uh, clicks sometimes user uh, users use the same account <laughs> so several people use the same account and uh, uh, when you think this is one user actually there are a couple of users and they have different preferences like from one user account and uh, you may see clicks to some toys and uh, at the same time you can see clicks to some I know screwdrivers for example <laughs> uh, yeah so this is this is a huge a huge problem when you try uh, when you do, when you try to deal with the real data and you have to like keep in mind during today's presentation that if you are asked to build a commander system to, uh, for a lender <laughs> you have to keep in mind all those points and like follow the presentation okay so that was a little long <laughs> and boring so let's let's talk about measures uh so measures uh why it's so important because uh if, if you want to define a uh, problem it's the same as defining as a quality measure so for me, yeah, if, you, if you have a quality measure, it's, it's the problem. If you, like, uh, for example, you want to defend your master thesis, <laughs> so the quality measure is the written master thesis and defended one. <laughs> so you have to start uh, as soon as possible. And then you have to proceed with your <laughs> uh, experiments and, uh, and so on. So it's kind of a joke, but it's a lame joke, so it <laughs> doesn't matter. But in, in any event, so when you, when you have a problem, it means that you have uh, so something to keep track of uh, of the quality of of the problem, but it's the problem of with the recommender systems because uh, we should know what we are doing, and uh, it depends on the domain. So I intentionally showed you that there are different domains, and different domains try to uh, model different preferences, or maybe not the preferences, or whatever. Uh, so it's slightly, not slightly, it dramatically depends on the topic, um, on the branch, or whatever, where you work. Okay, and uh, beside that, the evaluation of recommender system uh, is also a hot and open topic in the research community. Because even if you decide on the business metric, uh, what you want to do when you when you know what is your task, it's still hard hard to evaluate uh, those recommender systems from the technical point of view, like uh, because you can. Uh, you can have multitude of issues. For example, uh, in, those measures are biased. Whether this bias uh, like is uh, present in your data or this bias is present in the evaluation metric itself, how to decouple, decouple those biases and so on. So actually last year on uh, inf information trivial conferences, several talks were actually devoted to uh, evaluation measures. And yeah, I highly encourage you yeah, keep track of this uh, field because from a research point of view, it's very interesting and it's very worthy uh, to study. Okay, so uh, let's like make make it clear. So there are three perspectives of measures. So first, what I, what I mentioned is this business measure. Uh, I call them like online measures. So it's something that is happening online and uh, something that our business is uh, interested in. I will uh, like dive deep uh, into this on the next slide. Then we have some uh, offline measures. It's those measures that you kind of track the performance of the algorithm itself. So the online is the uh, progress of the entire system, of the entire editor commander, of the entire platform in some sense. And the offline measures is uh, like uh, the measure of your algorithm and that stay behind it. And the third point is just the connection between those two. Because it's also not that obvious that uh, those two uh, evaluation uh, measures uh, are like correlated or there is a dependence between them. And uh, just remember that if you can't measure, you can't improve it. So some people say that it's the second rule of data science or whatever. And it's <laughs> my favorite proverb, uh, to be honest. 
Okay. Uh, so let's move to online metrics. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, so uh, I already told you that it strongly depends on uh, on the domain. Uh, so they are imposed by the problem himself, and uh, it's something that uh, usually decided by the your corp corporate representative, your manager, product owner, or whoever is responsible for the product you are building or uh, the project you are contributing to. And uh, like typical examples uh, of uh, online uh, measures are number of clicks. Uh, sometimes it's called like click-through ratio, um, like amount of the view material, if you have some like or listen material uh, or amount of the uh, content you were exposed to, you talk uh, about uh, like streaming services, M obvious <laughs> measure is the money <laughs> or revenue or whatever is called on your platform on your uh, in your business. So, uh, uh, then uh, uh, like number of actions, like number of transactions per visit, usually it's called conversion. So it's like the probability that usual user will buy something when he saw your uh, ad or whatever. So we actually can invent tons of them. And, uh, <laughs> and this is super important. Like uh, you have to participate in this conversation. I already mentioned that uh, this is something that should be uh, discussed with your manager. But if you want to like, contribute and want you uh, to be successful, <laughs> you should participate in this conversation and like think critically whether you can uh, change these numbers. Because they can they can invent any any number any metric, but sometimes recommender system can like impact those numbers. For example, uh, at some at some platforms, you can just inf uh, influence uh, users to spend more money. You can like uh, influence them to click more or uh, open more, but not spend money because you don't have control over that. Sometimes you have, sometimes you don't. So be super attentive at this point and this is uh, matters. Okay, uh, so once you have this uh, measure that is important for you, then uh, what, we usually pe what people usually do with this measure, they use this uh, metric to calculate them during A-B testing. So A-B testing, for those who don't know, uh, <laughs> it's like you have a, um, imagine you have a web page and uh, you show two different versions of this web page to users, to A group, to B group, and you track the performance. You calculate these measures for A and for B group. And if uh, this difference between group A and group B in that measure is statistically significant, you can actually decide which algorithm, which version of your web page is better. Okay, so mm, the same is with recommendation with the recommenders. So it's highly encouraged to use this holistic approach when you actually <laughs> take the business decision where you choose the, you pick the algorithm based on the AB testing. And actually that's what we are doing in Allegro. We actually <laughs> test and uh, check and recheck whether we apply uh, those <laughs> whether our models increase the target metrics and only, and only then we deploy the production, the algorithm. Yes, so this is super important. Remember, A-B test is really good. And there is a huge theory about those A-B tests and like it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> another story. And it's a very long story about A-B testing. It's super interesting branch of science as well. So, okay, about offline measures. So, uh, with offline measures, it's a bit simpler. Uh, so imagine, imagine you have historical data and uh, you want like to train the model uh, from model in the sense of machine learning, classical machine learning uh, stuff. And uh, the thing is that you want to know whether you overfit or underfit, or do you want to increase complexity of your model or decrease or uh, what are you doing? So <laughs> this, is, this is important. And uh, uh, because it's super difficult sometimes to change the model, run the A-B test. Uh, sometimes those A-B tests may uh, last for like weeks. 
and uh, <laughs> actually it's impossible to tune one parameter and then like wait two weeks <laughs> and say oh <laughs> it was a blunder uh, yes so uh, we need something like proxy metrics that can be used online uh, offline and to, to quickly check our ideas and uh, sense metrics uh, the most popular ones and uh, the ones that we are using uh, at our day-to-day -day job is like recall, uh, hydrate, and there are also some slang information. So recall, it's like usual recalling cl classification. It's the uh, probability that the retrieved document is relevant for the user. Okay, um, so it's a good measure and uh, <laughs> it, says you, it says you so how how much relevant document uh, you will take out from your garbage so uh, for example for allegro as i mentioned you have like uh, 0.2 billion uh, if you are <laughs> better than one divided or over 0.2 billion so <laughs> you have non-trivial recall uh, yeah <laughs> it, it, it's again a joke Oh, but it's still a low, it's a very low number, it's practically zero, but, but still. Uh, then uh, it's not enough. Uh, so recall sometimes is not enough because it tells you uh, about the relevance and uh, it tells you nothing about the position on your uh, recommendation list. It turns out that usual, usually people tend to click topper positions on the recommendation lists or left uh positions if it's horizontal yeah if it's vertical it's top if it's horizontal like uh aligned so it's from left to right at least in our countries uh yes so uh let's say let's stick to the notation top the recommendation list and the uh, mean reciprocal rank is uh one of such measure measures that actually calculates how much of your how many of your documents uh, and uh, uh, are located on top uh, of your recommendation list. It's calculated over uh, uh, over all your uh, actually it's average over queries, but in any event, so for for one query you have to uh, calculate uh, ranks of your documents. Rank means first, second, third, and so on. Okay, uh, so you take one over uh, relevant document, and and that's your uh, rank. Yes, so for example, if you have a uh, relevant op document op uh, on uh, position two, then it's reciprocal rank, it will be one over two, okay? Um, and uh, if in the second query, the relevant document was on the uh, position three, it will be one over three. Then MRR for those such queries, for, for these two queries will be uh, one half plus one, th one over three, divided by two okay one twelve uh, <laughs> okay you, you, sh you should be familiar with this metric so uh, I, I, did, I didn't show you uh, i didn't drink an, an image so I, I hope it will be clear uh and uh, the problem with mrr uh, is that uh, this one over n penalty it's reciprocal rank is too heavy and uh it usually takes into account only top of the list so if you like have one uh, top five and uh, your recommendation list is like 20 or 60 items then uh, if something appears uh, in the middle of that list it will not be that uh, important for mrr so it will be almost zero and you will not notice the progress so if something moved from hundreds positions to 50s you will not notice it with mrr so for this reason, uh, people invented a discounted commodity gain, normalized discounted commodity gain. The logic is basically the same if, if you look at the formula, but uh, probably I will not give you that much detail, but it's the same. One over n, but uh, people took the logarithm of n. So one over logarithm of n, it's not that aggressive penalty for uh, uh, low, low uh, list items and uh, that's why uh, sometimes when you have long lists uh, of recommendations and it's better to use mbcg and uh, in fact uh, they correlate with uh, the data so one second it's... okay uh yeah so those two matters mrr and the MBCG, like in those examples uh, here, uh, they can be uh, 
So in, in our case, in our story, there will be implicit feedback. It means there is like zero one answer if document is relevant or irrelevant. Okay. So, so it's our story. There are some uh, extensions for uh, explicit feedback when you have ratings, so, but we will talk today about mostly about implicit feedback when the output, the answer is zero or one clicked on or not clicked, bot or not bot. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, so it's important question whether those online web and offline measures are correlated with each other. And uh, this is, uh, here I present you some plots that I actually generated <laughs> artificially and I know the answers, how they are correlated, but they look uh, super similar to what we see in production. So if, I, if you ask my colleague to tell what, which one is simulated and which one is the real one, they will like, <laughs> they will probably not tell you the truth, but I know because the number of points is a different <laughs> production. So yeah, so I, I'm allowed actually to show this. Uh, so let me explain the axis, then I'll explain you what are the points and uh, what are the clues from this uh, plot. So uh, the axis, uh, y-axis and each plot is the uh, online measure that our business is uh, uh, interested in. So GMV is gross merchandise volume. Uh, it's hard like to <laughs> memorize this. And just uh, the mnem mnemo technique for this is M it stands for money. <laughs> so okay, so it's a money metric. TX is transaction. CTR it's click through rate. So it's something that business in e-commerce platform is usually interested in, like money number of transactions and how people click uh, in our uh, offers. Uh, yes, and the y-axis is uh, the target metric, in this case in DCG, um, but we could like invent another metric, but in DCG is uh, like a really good um, case study, and uh, this actually we saw in production. So, uh, so first column is this in DCG, but in DCG is is here as presented on the previous slide, but calculated on clicks. So the relevant judgments uh, are clicks. So if user clicked on the item, then it's just a positive item. And then we uh, like calculate and this, this was the right answer of the algorithm. Okay, and the bottom uh, of uh, this plot is actually the transaction. So if user clicked, it's still a negative <laughs> reply, but if uh, a person clicked and bought the item, then this is a, a positive relevant a relevance judgment from the user. Okay, so I hope that it's uh, totally clear yeah, like what what's the difference between DCG clicks and transactions. Yeah, so that's, that's the main difference. Okay, then, uh, so we, first, uh, I don't like this type of uh, plots because uh, they are crowded and uh, there are too many and they like multiplicative way you can actually have, uh, you're fighting the combinatorics when you're plotting this stuff, but uh, it's like important from the pedagogical point of view. Uh, so we, what we did, we actually did, uh, created two models. The first one was trained somehow like black box model that tried to model uh, user preference on clicks. So we just want to predict clicks, something that, uh, yeah, try, try to guess whether a person will uh, click or not. And the second one, uh, is like this, uh, I don't know, it's red, yellow, I don't know what is the color, but you got the point. And the second one is uh, trained for uh, transactions. So yeah, we just want to predict what the a person will buy the item. And let's look on the top plot. Uh, we did two models evaluating on the same data. Uh, and uh, again, the model which was uh, trained on the on transactions uh, shows like better performance in terms of GMV. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of obvious in some, in some sense, but uh, if we like compare correlation between NDCG, which is evaluated on clicks, and the GMV, it's, this correlation is negative. So the better model you are, you're, you're building, if you track on clicks, the worse uh, 
yeah, the worst is for, for GV and so on. Uh, the same the same performance is actually reflected in transactions. Uh, you see, there is some scatter because uh, it's GMV means money and transactions, it's not the same uh, usually. And that's why it's not the same plot, but the overall trend is very similar. And, but if you look at CTR, the picture is like reversed. And uh, this model, the, the blue one, which was trained for clicks is actually performing better. The higher MDCG you have online, of line when you train the model on clicks, then the higher clicks the rate you will get with your model uh, online when you deploy the production. Okay, uh, so well, let's move to the bottom plot. So it's actually again the same data, but now we do the same evaluation, but uh, relevant judgment for NDCG we change to transactions. Uh, uh, and uh, like <laughs> it's it's hard to uh, read because there is some noise, statistical noise, but if you, you can see that uh, this yellow model gives higher NDCG in transactions action and thus higher uh, GMV, which is good. It's what we wanted. Actually, not we wanted, but <laughs> what we get. And what we wanted, we actually, is the second plot on the bottom, we have a higher MDCG on transactional MDCG, and we have a higher transaction rate, it means higher conversion. And actually, what we wanted uh, in our platform is just to increase this. And But when we look at CTR, again, we have negative correlation. So we will get uh, like lower NDCG for uh, for CTR, yeah. And uh, the problem is with the recommender systems, this behavior is not universal. <laughs> so in uh, like normal branch, normal in the uh, like in the different uh, branches of science, uh, there is such thing as universality of laws. In physics, there are, uh, there are some laws that are universal and they don't depend on the frame of reference. And with recommender systems, it's not the same. So you may not, you may not see the same picture on your platform. And that's the problem. And uh, this long story was just to remind you that you have to do it on your own. So you have to like when you, when you picked the target metric online metric you have to like confirm that your uh, offline metric correlates and not anti correlates with with the model and it's your job it's your like business to ensure that you are uh, doing the progress okay so again so the main takeaways uh, so first ask your business representative about their plans, what they are doing, and just uh, they should answer you. What do they want to do? And you like want to suggest them what which metrics can we impact and uh, increase. So always keep track of your online measures. Uh, if you like don't see these measures, you will not improve them. And it's important. Uh, yeah, always take one that fits you the, the best. So this previous uh, set of images actually showed you that you have to like change, check the correlations between those uh, uh, points and uh, use A-B testing yeah, to, to pick the final algorithm. One second, uh, you, didn't, you didn't ask the question and for most of you it was like obvious, but uh, I wanted to like detail. So each point represent each day of testing the algorithm. So this is variation from day to day, okay? So uh, if you count number of points, it will be like 20. It was like, it means there are 20 days. During those 20 days, we have this uh, different uh, scattering because of noise. So sorry, so sorry, I just forgot to mention, but it was not super important. Yeah, uh, it's still independent measurements. So yeah, we believe it. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's move to the next part. Uh, so. We already talked about the measures. And let's talk about at some uh, about some algorithm, and uh, just to have some incremental approach, uh, we will start with something simple. And something simple in our uh, today's presentation is this collaborative filtering. Uh, usually people ask why do you use those algorithms because we have deep neural networks we have we can actually AI solves everything and so on and uh, 
rarely filtering is like a stone age of machine learning. And uh, yes, probably, but I still like collaborative filtering for several reasons. And uh, first is uh, machine learning <laughs> and like AI yeah, is good when you have the data, when you have the clean data. So yeah, you can, you can actually uh, do a lot, but if you don't have the data, then you can. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, in case like in case of Allegro and uh, other platforms, uh, other web data, there is huge noise and biases uh, in the feature space uh, for, uh, for the data. And uh, when building um, like this model for the raw documents without human verification, you will get pretty strange results. And uh, that's one of the reasons. Yeah, and uh, there is some noise in feedback. Be beside the noise in the features, you have the noise and the feedback. The this makes your like uh, fine-tuned or fine-graded approach to recommender system even more uh, noise uh, like sus susceptible yeah susceptible so uh, yeah and uh, the last point yeah it's just interesting to see from the pedagogical point of view like how does it work and uh, let's let's look at some examples uh, so yeah, this is uh, so most of you are coming from the course of recommender system, and you probably saw this image multitude of times. Uh, actually, it's the first image from the internet that I uh, <laughs> typed about matrix factorization. But still, I want like to talk. Uh, probably some of you <laughs> didn't hear them, so let's let's ensure that we are on the same page. So. Um, like, and what is collaborative filtering? Collaborative filtering is a type of uh, if, uh, approach when you try to model the collective judgment of the crowd, crowd uh, in the sense that <laughs> most of the user, when they are buying the left shoe, they buy the right shoe. So probably you also will <laughs> enjoy the right shoe when you buy the left one. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is like uh, the collaborative filtering in the nutshell. So in, in all the data you need, you, you need to collect uh, user user item interactions. It means uh, you have some items on the platform. You have some users. For example, this row represents first user on the platform. He gave some ratings. So in this in this image uh, that I found on the internet, the feedback is explicit. So they make some ratings. So here. Uh, first user gave to the first item um, the highest rating um, then first user gave to the fourth I, uh, item three and just neutral rating and you can actually do this uh, you collect this matrix for all the users on the items on the system so in case of uh, negative, uh, implicit feedback it's just binary matrix Okay, then uh, the idea is uh, to factorize this matrix, uh, like you just not to factorize, use this matrix to predict those missing values because uh, in, in case of implicit feedback, zero means uh, that a person didn't see the item or it saw and he didn't like. And our goal is just to figure out, figure it out whether it didn't, he didn't like it or uh, uh, just he didn't notice uh, this item on the platform. Okay, so it's done uh, by matrix factorization. So we try to represent uh, items and users um, as lower rank matrices. It means one tall and one wide matrix, where each row and uh, each uh, column from the one and the row from another represent uh, item and the vector. Uh, correspondingly, so here R hat means uh, our prediction. Yeah, and uh, the loss function usually looks like this. So we want to uh, minimize the distance between the prediction that we make uh, and uh, the one original one, uh, original rating from this matrix here. Okay, so it should be simple. Uh, yes, and these terms correspond to regularization, which is typically you see in uh, machine learning nowadays. So it should not be surprised. So when you have when you train such models, you actually model the user preference 
yeah, and uh, it actually yeah, does the job and it's those like, super useful. So there are different approaches how to minimize uh, this function. And depending on which you take, it will give you different uh, algorithms. So there are like multitude of them uh, on the internet. And just here are some examples of, uh, yeah, of popular uh, schemes. Okay, so this is what about matrix factorization. And uh, um, there are some problems already with this approach. When you hit some scale, imagine that you have a huge, huge database, something like billion scale, and you have a really uh, large latent space. Latent space is this width of those two matrices, height of these matrices, it's like some uh, number of parameters. Then the linear scan, uh, it's the time of your scan through this database is just the linear time, uh, just multiplication of latent space times the height of uh, this database so this is the complexity of, of such search so uh, sometimes it's not enough it, it, sometimes you those factors of facts some of those factors are like uh, changing on the fly and uh, you have or some items get removed from this index on the flight and you don't want to recommend them or whatever uh, happens so uh, people stick to this approach when you uh don't do the direct search you do this approximate search so in fact what you are doing on the previous slide you are calculating the calculating the dot product between vectors it's actually an inner product but uh we can say that it's uh, like dot product of vectors and uh we can use uh in some sense it's the uh, search of uh of the nearest neighbors in the um, like uh, yeah in the dot product space yeah when this is your operation so there are multiple of approaches multiple of algorithms that actually speed up that can help you to go beyond this linear scale and uh, make it possible to serve such algorithm online so each time you want to make a prediction, you can actually run such approximate neural in your neighbor search and to yield some candidates. And it's pretty useful and it's used in production when you have huge numbers and uh, some of those factors may be dynamic, to be dynamically calculated. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one second, uh, let's talk about the problems with such uh approach yeah and this approach comes uh, comes from the uh definition of uh, matrix factorization is that it tries to increase increase or predict the average score on items like user preference but uh it does not take into account the business metric itself it's the first thing so we our business metric may be a bit different and the second thing, like the same, it's probably the same thought, but from a mathematical point of view, it doesn't take into account the ordering of the items. So actually, it's a good approach to try to increase high and like uh, pray <laughs> that uh, our model will learn good probabilities. So ordering will be okay. But in fact, uh, the order on the ranking list is also matters. And such matrix factorization approach may not. Uh, it obviously depends on data, may not reflect this ordering when you just try to learn uh, probability of click or transaction or whatever. So uh, what we actually doing in this situation is this Bayesian personalized ranking. So uh, it's something that I do like, one of the, uh, my favorite papers and my favorite approaches because it's like uh, an, an entire framework, an entire tool how to deal with uh, algorithms. So the main idea is just we, we don't want to calculate the model. Model uh, is defined by the, its parameters. Uh, the parameter of model on this slide are represented by Greek letter theta. theta. It's here. Okay, so we, what we actually want, we want to uh, maximize this probability, probability to, to obtain such parameters theta, given such sorting, uh, like such sorted, sorted list for a given user view. 
it can be uh, factorized in this way using some bias theorem. Uh, yes, and uh, the author of Bayesian personalized ranking says that uh, actually can can model the probability for uh, for ranking uh, probability to uh, for item E to be higher rank for uh, the rank higher than item G J for user U given the parameter in this using this formula sigma is the sigmoid function uh, x with hat or U I J is just the difference between x u i and x u j and u i and u j is the prediction of original uh, model in our case it can be matrix factorization for given user for given item okay so it's actually difference in scores obtained by the underlying model in other terms so like Bayesian and personal ranking is the uh, it's something that's built on top of the original algorithm and can convert point-wise algorithm to the pairwise so Bayesian personal personalized ranking the goal of this algorithm is just to make algorithm uh, sorting aware like position aware or like uh, yeah sorting aware it's probably the, the right word uh, yes and uh, in in this way like uh, what what do they want to optimize they optimize now the log sigmoid loss it means algorithm of sigmoid of this oops of this probability uh, minus some regularization term or plus some regularization term which comes from this probability and the claim of for the authors of pr is that uh, when you optimize such uh, criterion you actually uh, get a solution which optimizes AUC metric directly and you see is the area under the curve so I assume that you have some background in machine learning. So AUC is a typical metric that uh, deals with uh, like binary classification. So it's uh, <laughs> one axis. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to talk when no, I see nobody. So I don't know whether you understand what I'm talking about or not. So uh, let's say that AUC it's uh like the measure that tells you whether your classifier is good or not in some sense it says you that wrong class uh, wrong class wrong class prediction should have lower score than the right one okay in this sense AUC is better than a simple uh like binary output for uh like precision or recall because it takes into account the sorting so like negatively negative item should be like bot at the bottom of the list and in that sense when you're optimizing for AUC you are optimizing for better sorting on the list and the uh, Bayesian personal ranking is proved to give you uh, AUC optimal solution for uh, for a model it's the first advantage so it solves the issue that uh, your like, matrix factorization or whatever model uh, like deals on clicks now it deals on uh sortings um, like unsorted lists and this is good it's something uh, uh, which is really nice to have and the second thing that uh, bayesian personal ranking uh does uh, is actually model agnostic so we have on this formulas only scores that are produced from some models but it can be not only matrix factorization but any other algorithm that supports uh, uh, such things like uh, error propagation through during the learning process so this this is good and that's why we like uh, Bayesian personalized ranking because it gives you ability to uh, boost your um, business metrics directly okay so that's why i'm talking about Bayesian personalized ranking now okay so the main takeaways uh, so despite uh, those models that I was talking about are super simple and uh, uh, you probably heard of them, they are still used in production and you'll be surprised uh, about how powerful they are. Uh, so also there are like millions and uh, of implementations, different implementations on different uh, modern libraries. And uh, it's, you don't even have to 
call them. Uh, even this BPR uh, stuff is also coded for you. So we just feel free to use it and uh, experiment on the data. And uh, it's always a good uh, like choice of uh, in your life to start with this um, simple baseline model and then like to increase the complexity. So uh, <laughs> I recommend you to start from uh, this simple algorithms. Okay, uh, so next point uh, is ranking. Uh, so just a second ago, we talked about BPR uh, ranking, but we actually can, can go further. So we didn't talk about features right now, uh, up to this moment, we were talking that we can apply this uh, rank, uh, we can apply BPR to collaborative filtering model, and also, we didn't talk about the complexity about, uh, of this BPR. And yeah, and this is one of the advantages. So if you want to include features to create some heavy model, your, uh, the complexity now matters because you have to use more RAM, you have to use more CPU power. And in fact, uh, you saw on the previous slide, oh, sorry, on the previous slides, we have this inconvenience UIJ, which suggests you that you will have at least uh, quadratic um, complexity in number of items. So when you will, you will try to learn something, it will take you longer to like get the numbers. Oops. Uh, so what to do? <laughs> and uh, it's not uh, us, it's not our generation of ask such kind of questions. So there are a lot of uh, stuff on this topic. Usually, uh, in general, this topic is called learning to run. Uh, this, this branch of information material deals with uh, family of algorithms actually learns how to sort uh, things properly. So uh, yeah, and actually there was uh, a, a talk of my colleague Shamak on this uh, seminar a year ago. So I gave the link. Uh, I suppose it's your YouTube channel. <laughs> yes, so feel free to like to watch. I will not repeat all the stuff. I will just just briefly mention uh, this what what's going on here. Uh, yeah, so here is suspicious fry, and uh, here is the, <laughs> the main steps. So again, we want to get, maximize the probability of parameters theta given the sorted list. We again apply sigmoid function to the scores of some uh, model that depends on parameters theta, and it also predicts UI and UJ, which you saw earlier. We again try to increase, uh, I'm sorry, to optimize uh, the same log sigmoid Probability. I didn't wrote here the uh, regularization term, but uh, it's still the same. The same cost function. It was different. Is that is that uh, we can write the gradients explicitly in this in this way. So if you want to calculate the date rule like analytically, you will uh, eventually end up with such a formula. So there is, uh, this is Einstein summation. I know if you're familiar, so repeating indexes uh, imply summation. So there is a double sum. So here is this quadratic complexity in the number of items. And we have this term lambda yj. Uh, so some clever people from large corporations and large institutes uh, actually decided not to write this summation uh, uh, but approximate it, uh, and they invented a way to approximate this lambda uh, coefficients and make them like, constant for a particular uh, user. And uh, this constant uh, is proportional to the log sigmoid itself and in this EG. Actually, this log sigmoid comes from analytic uh, like consideration. And this delta in this EG uh, gives, uh, is a uh, like artificially imply, uh, imposed here, just to be able uh, to move your scores uh, in in this G space. So this approximation, uh, like here, allows you to optimize not only uh, AUC like was with BPR, but like uh, also <laughs> speed up your training and make it converge to optimal NDCG. Uh, or like near optimal NBCG and the whole like learning to rank 
uh, business is just dealing with this MBCG and uh, offline metrics because those are not differentiable. And uh, it's kind of problem to, to do it analytically, but it's kind of semi, it's, it's a semi MBCG optimization. It's like uh, not one-to-one. -one. It's again, it's an approximation. So yeah, the advantage of this approach is that uh, you can actually optimize your metrics directly uh, and your updates are faster. And uh, when you have this lambdas, uh, lambdas can be actually steps in your gradient boosting uh, algorithm. So you can try to model the lambdas directly. And there are super efficient implementations uh, of lambda rank algorithm in uh, standard uh, tree-based algorithms. So they are usually called lambda mart and so on. So they just try to model lambdas. And then when you sum such lambdas, you will get something that minimizes your NDCG because you have this delta NDCG uh, in your formulas. Yeah, and uh, such implementations are super efficient. And uh, it turns out that you can just use your preferent uh, Library like EGBoost, like GBM, CatBoost, uh, and so on that implement gradient boosting. And they have implemented for you uh, such ranking algorithms that uh, try to boost in DCG directly. So, what we gain, uh, what, we, what we get from, from this, it, it actually uh, allows it, so this lambda rank and lambda mark are optimized for uh, ranking with first with features and then uh, it actually actually tries to boost the target metric. And this is really good. Uh, so this is that good that it actually opens a door for hybrid recommender systems that actually can be uh, created in two steps. So like first step, which is a heavy one, which tries to make this collaborative filtering business separately. So filter billions of users and uh, millions of items, create like hundreds of candidates, and then you can use the features of those hundreds of candidates and you can make the predictions for them because it's super difficult even with those optimization that I introduced a second ago with the Lambda rank algorithm, it's still, it's still not scalable, it's not feasible like to make prediction online for billions of items, but for hundreds of items, it's still okay. It's already okay. Uh, Yes, and uh, so the hybrid systems actually uh, useful. Uh, yeah, and uh, sometimes they can be uh, applied when when you have a not, when you don't have that much of data. For example, you have a lot of users, a lot of items, but in your uh, recommendation window, there are only a few clicks or your target signal, you know, it's really noisy. So you can use such a uh, well-defined uh, algorithm like Lambda Mart. You can uh, try on a couple of examples and then you can see already some boost in your performance metrics. Okay, uh, so yeah, it was a bit long, but uh, the main thing is, so it's possible to use features uh, when you are preparing the recommendation list. You can use features of items, of users, and so on. And usually those are incorporated in such like learning to rank approaches. Uh, yeah, this learning to rank also gives you a possibility to optimize like multitude of metrics, whatever is uh, whatever you wish. And uh, yeah, sometimes hybrid recommender system is a very good approach on your uh, platform. Okay, personalization at scale. Uh, so what is personalization? In uh, in Allegro, <laughs> so first it's very difficult difficult to define personalization, but because it's difficult to measure the progress of personalization for various reasons, and I will not do like deep. <laughs> <laughs> deep dive into this topic because it's super super hard uh, to define so in the base in very basic setup like uh, in layman terms you just uh, personalization you want to have a different uh, recommendation feed for different users so imagine you enter the platform you made some interactions you bought something you clicked something and uh, then your colleague <laughs> 
enter the platform with different set of actions. So both of you should get a different uh, set of recommendations, but this set of recommendation is strictly related to your actions. Okay, you can you can uh, <laughs> make different recommendations in very different ways, and the same thing can randomize the output of recommender systems. But it's not what we want to do here. Okay, so that's what, that's what's my my point uh, right now. Yeah, and the problem with such personalization is that when you try to make uh, this user item fact, uh, factorization at billion scale, and uh, it's super hard to do. So there is a huge sparsity in the in the data itself. So, um, but <laughs> this uh, highly popular items were like clicked almost by everyone. So this sparsity is not enough. Uh, is is not that high to keep the data in memory of a single machine. And it's super difficult, like, to make this factorization. Uh, or even if you manage to do such factorization, the inference may take you longer than a single day uh, just to predict the factors for specific users. So uh, it still will be like difficult. If you have like supercomputer that runs these computations in a second, it will be unfeasible from the cost point of view like you will not get that much money from the recommendations uh, because you spend uh, you, you have to spend a lot on preparing to prepare the candidates for specific users so in this sense uh, like direct uh, user item decomposition is like not the best the best uh, not the best idea because of the scale and uh, we have to like invent a way to tackle the problem and uh, what uh, is the answer is the session-based recommender systems. And let me uh, like explain briefly uh, what are the session-based recommendations. So imagine a user like me, <laughs> uh, I enter the platform and I do some interactions. So I click one offer, second offer, third offer, and so on. So I made a set of actions. And actually, set of actions is just a collection of uh, pages I enter. Because then 99% of the pages you have on e-commerce platform is just the uh, web pages of particular product. So what if we tell that user is it's uh, what defined user? It's history, recent history. Like uh, when you enter the platform and make uh, some consecutive clicks, in items, those actually characterize the user. In this sense, we are like simplifying the problem. So you don't have to uh, keep in memory billions of, uh, of offers. You have only millions because uh, from day to day, like those items from long past, from five years ago, <laughs> were not clicked most likely. So we can ignore them as a, as a noise. And uh, you can use only the recent ones and it will reduce uh, your uh, target space to millions. And then, uh, as I said, yeah, so each uh, user uh, is represented as a sequence, as a sequence of actions. So session is a user, user is its session. And uh, here we show like, item one, click the first, uh, I click item one, then I click item two, item three, and so on. And then when we build a model, we try to predict the next click, the next event, what will happen on the platform. So for example, we have item one, what will happen next? Then what will, uh, we try to predict what will happen in two hops, in three hops, and so on. So if you look at this uh, and think about this, like longer, you will notice that it's very similar to uh, language modeling problem when uh, you have a sequence of tokens or words and you want to predict the next word, next token based on the previous sequence. So you model the conditional probability of token next uh, based on previous tokens. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. But the, the issue with this is that uh, e-commerce platform is not language, not a nat natural language, and there is no rules. So in our languages, we actually have some rules, we have some structure, and uh, like different languages have different uh, inherent structure. We have like, nouns and grammars. In uh, e-commerce, at e-commerce platform, we don't have grammars. And this is, uh, at some sense, a huge problem and challenge for such kind of recommender systems. 
Okay, so um, the thing is that uh, <laughs> we can't use the pre-trained bird and uh, yeah, <laughs> and as the win for a language model because uh, our data is not a, like the corpus. Uh, it's not the corpus uh, of regular text. So, but still, we can use similar approaches uh, in in our case. And, and uh, the typical uh, structure of sequential recommender system um, can be represented as follows. So first we like have uh, some tokens. In, in our case, it's a bit simpler because we don't have to represent words. Uh, we already have tokenized text in the sense that each token is the offer ID or item ID, and we represent them as embeddings. Okay, then we can input those embeddings to some network. It's written attention network because attention is popular nowadays. So if you look at papers from two years ago, oh, sorry, uh, four years ago, then you will see that it was like LSTM, GRU, or whatever network architecture was popular at the time. You can you create the representation of the entire sequence like one, two, three, uh, four, and then uh, like you have representation of the last item. So in yeah, the, the main difference uh, from the language modeling is that you are highly impacted by the last item. So in recommender systems, there are actually, at least in our platform, there is a high demand that your recommendation feed should be strongly related to what you are actually currently watching. So you can't uh, be too intelligent and too smart. Uh, you, if you have a screwdriver, you we are required to show screw, screwdrivers, not some house parts or, uh, <laughs> or whatever. So yeah, there is, there, there is some strict uh, requirements. Then you do some linear transformation and you try to predict the index of the embedding um, that will come next. Okay, uh, so yeah, at the training time, you can use cross entropy, whatever negative sampling, triplet laws, you can apply BTR to have a good sorting uh, and strategy, a good sorting strategy. So using this, you still can have a wake up date and you can just train such network. And uh, this is something that actually works. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, a perspective field. So, and this way you can actually fight the scale. So you can do this for uh, for your platform to personalize the feed. So yeah, the takeaways, uh, there are alternative approaches uh, yeah, to like to fight the short length documents at billion scale. So you just, you have to do uh, like sequential recommendation. It's approach used by like many, many recent papers. Yeah, also one can use uh, power of deep learning. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to stress that there is no features in such recommendation. It's pure, pure collaborative filtering. We have uh, like implicit feedback. So in the sense that we already taking the clicks, it's already implicit feedback. Uh, yeah, and the last thing that at scale, we have to remember about the computational cost. Uh, so maybe it, discussion part i will like tell you more about this stuff why, why it's tricky or i will ask you uh, what will happen here and it will be more funny uh, so okay let's let's move next uh about future experiments experiments so it's something that i'm interested in uh and uh, i'm i'm working in my spare time and not spare time <laughs> so it's uh graph neural networks. Uh, when, I, when I heard about graph neural networks, I was super skeptical about them because they were, they were everywhere. So most likely somebody of you are writing your master thesis and you are writing your thesis on graph in neural networks and will not be surprised because it's super, super popular nowadays. But in fact, uh, it actually can be used uh, in uh, recommenders. As well. So the thing is, with graph neural networks is that it takes uh, they take uh, into account topological structure uh, of of the network in the sense network of clicks. So let's say that we define graph uh, of items if they were clicked in the same session. So imagine that I clicked product D and A. Some of you clicked product A and B. So 
we can create a graph between uh, those points in the sense that D points to A, A points to B. Okay, and in this image is uh, undirected graph because I <laughs> didn't find a directed graph and a nice picture on the internet, so it will be indirected graph. So, but uh, I suppose it's clear how, how to build the graph from sessions. So, uh, so two items are neighbors if they appear in the same session, uh, user session. Okay. Then, uh, what second, second second intuition? So, if you are like clicking screwdrivers uh, and you click one screwdriver, second screwdriver, then probably the features of such screwdrivers that you are clicking among the tongues that are present on the web page there must be something similar between them. Probably color, probably price, probably the uh, the city in which the seller is located, uh, and so on and so forth. So probably the next stuff that you will click will have the same uh, features or feature features that are like somehow related. Okay, and uh, this is this is the intention that what we what we want to have in, in our uh, in our model when we uh, trying like to build a, to build to build it. Uh, so what uh, graph neural networks do? Uh, networks do they aggregate the features from neighbors in order to create the representation of the given node. Okay, uh, so uh, in this example, um, they, they show uh, a simple, um, like, uh, a simple image of how uh, graph convolution works. So we want to build a representation of node A. So we have to take into account all its neighbors uh, and aggregate them. So for first. Uh, yeah, so we take features of A like in the previous iteration, so the raw features of that node, and then concatenate with those uh, features of uh, their neighbors. M means neighborhood of A. Okay, multiplied by some gamma, then we have some like uh, linear transformation or nonlinear transformation. It already depends. Okay, but the, the main idea is just concatenate, okay, concatenate your features with the features of your neighbors because. Uh, of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, the second the second step uh, is just to calculate the features of your neighbors. One of the neighbor of node A is B. Okay, B it's here, and then B is defined the same way. <laughs> it's uh, the features of node B plus its neighbors. So we expand uh, further. So neighbors of B are, are C and A. So in order to calculate the update for A you have to calculate update <laughs> for B and A again. So in some sense, it's a recursive uh, stuff. <laughs> so it's a recursive definition when, when, when you do like this. So, but there are different methods in graph neural network literature, how to like approximate uh, those stuff. You can actually uh, stop at some point. You don't have to expand for infinity because it can converge. Because it converts, there are some theorems that and empirical facts that show that uh, those uh, networks converge. And uh, in particular, on this example, we actually stop at the second hop. So we, uh, if we see, uh, uh, we just expand to the second neighbor. So, like one neighbor one neighbor, second one. So we don't take already neighbors of A. So this is already approximation of the real graph neural network. Okay, so we just don't don't go to infinity because in, in real in the graph neural network and fully connected, you like do the update of the entire network in one hop. Okay, uh, and in this way, you will have this collaborative filtering information already encoded in, in, in your network in your weights. So this is this is particularly good, and uh, uh, the studies show that it's enough just to train your network not the, on the entire graph of uh, of your data, but on the sub part. And uh, most of the web page documents graph some like a similar structure, and uh, you can train on the part of your graph, and then try to like uh, propagate to other stuff. So you don't use IDs of offers; you use their features. So you already don't have cold start. And uh, because of this topological structure, uh, you have a highest ch chances, chances that uh, 
it will work similarly on other network on other parts of your uh, like entire graph. Okay, the, the disadvantage is that it has a huge amount of hyperparameters and uh, yeah, the structure of the network of the model is a hyperparameter itself, which is kind of difficult and also you have this recursive structure which makes it slow. So uh, this, this is one of the big disadvantages, it depends how you will code it strongly. It's okay, so if you have the representation of one node, so the, the picture we saw earlier is like here, it's reversed uh, from left to right. Uh, yeah, so we can create embeddings for one node, for B, uh, for B node, and then you can do the same uh, stuff. And cosine similarity calculate where like uh, cosine equals to the signal whether A and B were clicked together or not. In the same sense, it's uh, it can be similar. It can be used like with BPR loss, so it can can be also optimized for our target metric. It can be optimized with some like lambda rank style, and uh, we can boost our intended metrics. So that's why that's why I think it's super attractive because uh, for like GNNs, um, collaborative filtering comes in two different editions. First one is here when you calculate the update of the weights, and then you when you when you like impose it on the uh, answers when you try to predict the answer. So it's like super powerful in this sense. So yeah, the takeaways like uh, so we can you, you can actually use GNNs very large graphs, but with this uh, asterisk that you have to limit the number of uh, like recursive calls. Uh, yeah, and uh, such models are really interesting because uh, yeah, I see I see some potential. Not only me, actually there are some implementations. Actually, those images are stolen from the Pinsage uh, yeah, paper, and they use it in production. They gave, they, they showed on the paper huge gains. So I'm glad for them. <laughs> Most likely it will, uh, it will work. So I wrote a box, so it's like take away. There is a cat in this box. It means that we still uh, have to try it yourself. Um, I'm, I'm not super 100% sure that it will work. So it's a cat in a box. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the end of the theoretical part, uh, and uh, I wanted to like to give you some papers to read, uh, something interesting. So BPR, BPR, I, I think it's a beautiful paper. Uh, so personalized ranking from implicit feedback because yeah, uh, it's it's not the algorithm itself; it's a framework, and uh, it's like one of the examples of uh, thinking outside of the box. It's from my point of view, it's one of these like real scientific papers. Uh, the main, uh, like theoretical, I mean, it's theoretical papers. Um, then we have like criticism paper. It's uh, a bit different. It's not a theory. It's like empirics, and uh, are, we really, are we really making much progress? A work analysis of recent uh, neural net uh, neural recommendation approaches. Yeah, it, it's a bit old, it's like two or one years old, I, I don't remember, and uh, they have some criticism, criticism is, is something I do like, uh, yeah, and uh, they actually try to repeat some experiments and they fail and they sh show why they fail, and uh, this paper demonstrates the importance of this evaluation in the recommender system world. Yeah, second, oh, sorry, third one uh, is this evaluation of session-based uh, recommendation algorithms. It's not about the measures, uh, <laughs> despite the fact that the title suggests, it's about uh, session-based recommendation algorithm, about the families and different approaches in the field. And the last one is this one, the PinSage uh, paper about like, web scale recommender systems and uh, yeah, about GNNs. So if you are interested in, Okay, so now, now, now let's move to something uh, probably simpler and uh, more interesting for you. Uh, it's like about the production, some, some words about production. Uh, yeah, it's also, I have to be like super careful because uh, <laughs> I probably can say everything from security point of view. Yeah, and uh, so, but let's let's try. So, uh, so how to serve the recommendation? First, uh, what what actually differs when you, when you look at the paper, you read the paper, you, 
good authors actually provide the link to uh, GitHub with this paper. You open the GitHub, it runs on one machine, and it's good. So we actually understand. But the thing is that modern applications are not uh, like simple applications that are running on a single machine. Usually, uh, what we are dealing with today in the modern world is like all applications are microservices. Uh, since you're computer science students, I don't have to explain you much, but uh, in any event, so you have a multiple of uh, programs that are running on different machines that are communicating with each other, creating a network of uh, like micro programs that entirely build the entire like web application, which is super useful. And uh, since it's not a single machine, we have to say that you have to have uh, infrastructure. Since you have microservices, you have to have some infrastructure. In, uh, in our case, we have like uh, twofold in infra in the sense that there are private computer centers owned by our company uh, and fully managed so like hardware uh, and uh, all the consequences of that uh, so and part of our applications uh, are running there some part of the application is running in public cloud in google cloud so we do some like processing, data processing there. And uh, yeah, and it's kind of uh, both interesting, funny, and challenging, both I mean, threefold. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, again, so those recommendations uh, can be integrated differently um, in those, uh, in this world of microservices, like uh, depending on the business requirement, depending on speed. So maybe speed is one of the like uh, hardest uh, restrictions on uh, on such web service because we just don't want your users to uh, to wait. Uh, so you can you can serve your recommendation as a regular application. Again, you have some input. You have uh, your uh, application returns does some calculations and returns some output. Uh, and it's. It's one way to like serve your recommendations, and another way is just through the database. Imagine you have some heavy lifting; you have to do some heavy computation. You can do it uh, like once per day, once per month, or whatever. Uh, I suppose like uh, Spotify make the recommendation list for a week, so they do the computations for one week, I suppose, or maybe they change. So uh, it doesn't matter. And then actually you fill the database and when you enter the service, you don't wait uh, <laughs> hours to get the recommendation list. You assert uh, right away. And then this is made by just pre-calculating the scores for recommendations and serving them through the regular database. Or yeah, it depends. Uh, so lo lots of uh, lots of stuff. Uh, in our uh, in our platform uh, are made in the form of uh, hybrid recommenders and i wanted to present exactly the hybrid recommender in the sense because it's uh, has less trivial graph and like uh, the logic is interesting so imagine you have a hybrid recommender system uh, you can you can build your services as a blocks like like showed here so you have some block that is responsible for user signal. So you have to like uh, collect some clicks, pre-process them, uh, form them from the input, like, uh, like implicit or explicit feedback to your algorithm and everything is, is online, okay? Then you have to put to your recommendation, uh, like recommendation generation algorithm. So this is another web application uh, here or a database. Uh, once you get the recommendation, you have to communicate with the service, with your services to check whether these uh, recommendations are still available and uh, yeah, to filter to filter them, just not to waste time on those uh, items that are no longer available. Uh, second step is just to apply this re-ranking based on features that I like showed you some times ago that you can like use some gradient boosting so on and so forth to just to re-rank the recommendation uh, feed. Yes, and the last part 
it's just do some filtering and apply some business logic. Like you don't have uh, to show explicit products for uh, children and so on and so far as it's just like standard story. And also you have to like put uh, right things to uh, like uh, write outputs on the platform. As I mentioned, the platform is maybe dynamic. So you, you want to decide where, where this recommendation will go at this point. Uh, okay. So what are what are the, the, the benefits uh, with uh, with this structure? Is this uh, it allows you to like to use uh, to use pros of uh, those different advantages of different pieces, uh, like mitigating the disadvantages. Uh, so sessions you. you uh, when you generate the sessions of users, you're actually making structured data from the unstructured one. Uh, then you are fighting the scale when you're generating the recommendations. So you are uh, reducing your working space from the billion of offers to the hundred of offers. Then actually you are working with hundreds of offers. Then you like limit uh, to the and of offers that will be seen by users. And then you can actually run this, uh, your backend services on 10 offers and do the sorting properly so it will not take long. Uh, and this structure actually allows you to write uh, those components in different languages, uh, which, is, which is super useful. And those components can be independent. So arrows means just the data flow. Uh, maybe not the flow, but the data. <laughs> uh, data flow can be can go in different directions here, but uh, it will allow you to first save a lot of computational resources because you don't have to work uh, to store it on a huge, huge machine, and always uh, like which always should run. So you don't have uh, to have like uh, spend time on a super expensive machine with uh, like billions of RAM. Uh, you just you use it here. Uh, second, you can you can scale each of this component independently. So if you need more services or machines that prepare sessions, you can just make those and uh, leave uh, this blob separately uh, and so on. So this allows us uh, scaling and uh, yeah. So this is super important why, why we want to have this microservice architecture. Uh, even for recommendation. Okay, and uh, one thing specific to Allegro, we wanted to uh, like uh, be uh, to stay with friends. So uh, MLOps is a big thing uh, today. So we also have our own like MLOps infrastructure in the sense that we as a research engineer, we are like taking care only about like two uh, gray blobs that correspond to the algorithm itself. And we are like the one to deal with uh, web programming, uh, web sockets, uh, databases, and so on. So everything is encapsulating in this uh, MLOps infrastructure. They actually provide us uh, a very simple and uh, like handy tools for uh, making your algorithm available online, which is called like online prediction, which is a framework that allows you like to to upload your model, and will it, it will do all this uh, job responsible for uh, like taking and answering HTTP requests uh, for you. Uh, yes, also like accessing the features you don't to have your own like bicycles each time. So there is a unified way to access the feature, and this will be logged, and then you can. Uh, uh, yeah, manage the data in a universal way. So we have uh, feature storage, uh, which is specific, and this is the part of ML MLOps uh, team. And also they store um, different tools for annotations, uh, data transformations, and, th and everything which is related to the data. Yeah, and um, that's pretty much it. So that's how we interact with MLOps, and it's kind of great because they make our lives easier. Okay, uh, so, uh, and the last part, maybe just like uh, lessons learned and <laughs> some good tips for you for future is just uh, how to do like from paper, what, what to do 
if you want to go this way, painful way from the paper to production. And sometimes it's really difficult, <laughs> and but sometimes it's easy. And uh, I want if you if I want to make your uh, so here I want to make your experience like smooth. So like general rules <laughs> try to find existing uh, implementation don't invent the wheel each time you have to so usually uh, authors provide their implementation check check whether this implementation works on your machine if it's not if it's not that probably you will not repeat the results so don't waste your time uh, yeah scale matters uh, remember about this it's also a big trick if something works on uh, like millions of items it probably <laughs> will not work on billions of items and so on so just think think about scaling whether it will scale or not uh, yeah when when you already have the like working algorithm and you want to like make it work on production make the service just look at uh, some optimized implementation of, uh, of some libraries or uh, formats and like now if you use like PyTorch and uh, uh, different stuff for neural networks uh, tensorflow there is open neural network format which is quite good uh, read about them maybe in one year it will be an obsolete information so <laughs> uh, take it with a grain of salt uh, uh, yes, when you use this ANN search, it's also a good thing. Just don't believe anyone. You try your own uh, index configuration, try your own uh, approximate configuration for uh, neural network, uh, nearest neighbor search, because it, it matters. Yeah, and the last thing, which is painful uh, and a hard, pill to, a hard pill to swallow is just data versioning matters. Your results should be reproducible and uh, you should version the data and this data should match the code you're writing. And uh, most of the time you will be doing, um, will be dealing, dealing on the project to match your data with your code. So think first <laughs> about this stuff. It's super important. Uh, yeah, and the last part uh, is some of this, uh, some of the steps you will do. Uh, you will think it, it will happen once, like prepare the data, filter, and so on. Uh, yeah, it's true only for scientific papers. Uh, like they have uh, fixed data sets, so you don't have to run some like uh, data conversion multiple times. But if you have production data, data changes, and uh, some jobs may become recurrent. Yeah, as the same way as uh, model training might become recurrent. Uh, recurrent. So always think about some automation tools like uh, you know, Airflow. Uh, Apache Airflow or Luigi or whatever that makes your uh, your jobs recurrent, so you can actually easily click and uh, go through all of your flow and uh, obtain the results. So try try to model like uh, yeah, think big. <laughs> so think big about your models. Uh, yeah, and the last thing, uh, so think about evaluation. Evaluation on the large data sets may be expensive. So it's sometimes, it's usually, not sometimes, but it usually becomes a recurrent job. So actually you want to schedule the evaluation in order to know the result. So that, yeah, so that's, that's the clues. Uh, it may, may, may be useful for you. So in summary, yeah, I, it was really long. I expected it to be faster. I'm very sorry. Uh, so we discussed importance of the evaluation. So evaluation is super important. Uh, we discussed the main algorithms. We discussed how to achieve those metrics we actually uh, prepared for ourselves. We introduced uh, some hybrid recommender systems. Uh, yeah, sequential recommender system also I showed you, GNNs, and then we talked about like typical stuff related to the implementations. Yeah, so that's all like from my side. Maybe the final remark is just always remember about the data. Uh, the thing is like we are biased. Yeah, think about the bias you actually bombarded with because uh, when people uh, publish a paper, they paper they publish something that is built upon like fixed data set, and uh, that's that's an issue for you because uh, if, if something is like good for this data set, it might not be good for you, for your business goal, uh, yes. And uh, moreover, 
the data sets the data sets in scientific community and competitions are fixed because you want to like boost the algorithm but when you are doing in production you can change the data set and sometimes changing the data set <laughs> like matters more to your uh, to solve uh, yeah, to your task yeah so you will be closer to the solution when you like tech, uh, tweak the data yeah and uh, like always think about this always think about tweaking the data and then remember about this book so big huge model is always good but uh, uh, model that's trained on uh, bad data it's a bad model <laughs> a weak model trained on a good data it's a good model yeah so it's enough and just one if to write one if to have a really good model if your uh, data is linearly separable <laughs> so yeah remind, remember about this so it's maybe one of the main takeaways from this presentation so thank you Sasha, thank you so much for, for your great talk. So I'm just switching.